Um, because I didn't realize how big this room was. Um, you see on the wall there, it's something I do in strategic foresight workshops. I ask the audience, and it's a little difficult here because the room is so big, and to write on a sheet at the beginning what their personal and professional greatest concern is about their well-being. And then at the end, I ask everybody to comment on what they wrote down, whether they changed their mind, whether they feel more strongly or not. Now, I won't ask that, but if some of you during my presentation or afterwards have something you want to talk about because you feel particularly strongly about it, I invite you to do that. Uh, with her well-being, how secure can you be? I don't know. I certainly don't know how secure I can be. But I do know from long and painful experience, a little of which I'll describe in a minute, that unless we take time and make an effort to anticipate what the future will hold and prepare for it, personally and professionally, by shaping the trends and the drivers that influence it, we will not be as secure as we could be. We can just stand back and let the future roll over us. That's a choice we can make. But if we do, our well-being will be more fragile than it needs to be. That's tomorrow, that's next week, that's next year. It's your children and your grandchildren's future. Yes, it's the future, but we can effectively shape some of it. My intention is to talk about well-being, about security, in a way that helps us better appreciate its scope, which, again, from my experience, is much wider than most people understand. It's because of our busy lives, it's because of our backgrounds, it's because of our expertise. But it is amazingly broad. And if we un appreciate its scope better or more, we'll be probably, probably more willing, more able to do what we can to shape it and do so in time. How many times has something shocked us or surprised us that standing back two or three days, two or three weeks, a year or so, we know that had we worked to think about that probability, that plausibility, we could have made it less shocking, less surprising. And if it was a bad thing, less costly. So, a little bit of an outline. First, a little bit about me, in addition to sort of the standard CV thing, because I, help it, I know it helps people situate what I have to say. And then I'm going to ask each of you to help me understand who is here with me. So very, very briefly, to say where you're from, and because we can't write it up there, if you would, tell me what your concerns are. Then I'm going to talk about context, and I'll explain very clearly why that is an important part of any presentation, in my view. And then some specifics about security, but not the normal ones. I'm not going to talk about climate change, not going to talk about corruption, They're connected with some of the things I'm going to say, but again, I'm going to try to broaden our appreciation of security in our lives. And then I have an option, given that it's busy and complex and complicated out there. And I will offer the option as a way for discussion, and if this evening, tomorrow, enter time, you'll have my email address, you want to talk about these things, please let me know because that helps me learn. Then I mentioned I was a nuclear engineer. That was my education. With one short exception, the nuclear submarine program way back in the 80s, I've never done any nuclear engineering. My life has almost totally been in security. And most of that in 
human security, not military security. I've been on a number of peacekeeping operations. When I lived in Jakarta for one year, uh, because of a bit of a coincidence, I was a bodyguard for a year for a very senior executive of a gold company. That was a very interesting year. Because at the same time, I... For Placer Dome. For an executive in Placer Dome. And taking that story a little bit further, how many of you remember the Briex saga? Well, that was part of my remit. That happened while I was there in Indonesia. That was a story that still is unbelievable. And notwithstanding the six books that have been written, some by very, very good journalists, Jennifer Welsh among them, the story has not been told. And the story that has been told is not only incomplete, but massively inaccurate. And I'll come back to that issue shortly. Pain. In my life, personal and professional, the times when it has been roughest and hardest and costliest is when I didn't take the time beforehand to think about what might happen or could happen. I didn't have to take the whole day. I didn't have to spend a long time on this. But when I did not look forward. Now on a very simplistic level, tonight if you're going out tomorrow, you'll probably look at the weather forecast to decide if you need a coat, an umbrella. That's normal life. And I submit to you that we could all do much more of that, looking a little bit more forward on issues of well-being. Of course, if you get soaked and it's just about zero degrees out, your well-being is probably going to suffer if you don't prepare for going out then. But I have had some very nasty times in my professional and personal life because I did not look forward. Because of my background and pain in history, one of the things I do now is security foresight workshops. And I do that based on a premise. I will let you read this. If you can't see it, please let me know and I'll read it out. So five domains and human securities, seven factors. And just so you're aware of the domains, national defense, pretty convention historic, the defense of the nation against outside aggressors. Homeland security, security within the nation because of external people, internal people, events, whatever, but inside the nation. This, of course, took on massively greater impact after 9-11. But there were issues and events before 9-11 because most countries in the world, Canada not being one of them, have an interior ministry. And an interior ministry is always about homeland security. Public safety, everything from building codes, medical systems, emergency services, crisis response and recovery, an increasingly important one as events that are dangerous and costly seem to be increasing. In fact, if we believe what Organizations such as the Asia-Pacific Association of Crisis Management State, they're going up by 8% a year. That's serious crisis. Now, they could be natural disasters or they could be industrial accidents. And we can all think of several of those. And lastly, 
one that we haven't done a lot of thinking about in the past is the Big Bang, the existential threat, the near-Earth object, the asteroid. Anybody who saw pictures, watched the videos of that comet or asteroid that exploded over Russia just last year and could have landed, or who reads some of the data about how many of those things there are in the sky, that's one issue. But others are like a pandemic. Or a tsunami. Or another war. There are existential threats. They deserve, they are serious enough, their probability is just about enough that they deserve some thought. So, those are the five domains of security, of well-being. And since 19, or 2004, the United Nations Development Project, the Human Development Report, we have the seven sectors by which human security is defined and explained and worked on. And of course, each of disease, hunger, unemployment, crime, social conflict, political repression, and environmental hazards relate to, impact, influence, one or more of the domains. It's a very dynamic stew, our well-being. We often talk, we've got to find a solution to this problem. But I think in the world that we live in now, especially in terms of our well-being and our security, looking forward, going forward, tomorrow, next week, next year, solutions might be a pipe dream. We've got to talk about progress. <coughs> Continuous progress. How many remember the book, what was it, Fukuyama, uh, The End of History? 15 years ago? History didn't end. History is continuing. Nothing ends. Unless one of the hugest, worstest existential threats comes true. It continues. And every time we try to fix a problem, we change it. We change the conditions that affect it. And therefore, we have to change how we're fixing it. And if we can keep it under control, if we can manage it well, that's progress. Progress is not backsliding. Progress is managing what besets us. As I say, even if we could get over our habit of trying to solve problems in ways and with means that existed when the problem arose, Einstein has an expression. That you can't solve problems with the ways and means that existed when the problem arose, which is what I'm saying. In fact, very often the ways and means we're trying to apply to problems of well-being today are part of the reason we have the problem, because times have changed. We have to get serious about moving forward instead of trying to drag old ways and means into the new world. You, again, it will help me. Quite a variety. And that pleases me because that's right. That's the issue. If we all walked out here right now and started to work on the thing that disturbed us most, we wouldn't be working together because we'd all have a different job. But that's important that we understand that. And that relates to what I'll propose as my option at the end of my little discussion here. Thank you. Context. Context, context rules. Ignore it, ignore any of it at your peril. And this is not a complete philosophy lesson, but it's the three things that, again, in my experience, mean most to me about what context is. It is what it is in this room. The room is warm, it's lit, 
there's 15 of us here. Uh, there were people outside making noise. It's the University of Toronto. It's a democratic country. We're not at war with anybody. We're probably safe going home tonight. That's part of context right now. It determines what we can do and cannot do now, today, or, or tomorrow. Certainly in the time that's predictable with certainty for us. And it's a start point for what can be done or not, next or tomorrow. And in my humble opinion, the disasters that were preventable were not prevented because people did not take full account of context. So I've got some pictures, pictures worth a thousand words, sometimes, sometimes. There are no experts, none, on the future of anything. A lot of people say they are, but they aren't and they can't be. So when any time you hear somebody say, I know, we've got a problem and I know how to fix it, 10 years now, five years now, whatever, um, go and get your salt shaker. You see, ask the expert who, what, when, where, why, how. Don't know. And if you can't read it, the experts there are saying, I know nothing about the subject, but I'm happy to give you my expert opinion. And I am sure, <laughs> I've met several people like that, I'm sure you have too. Secondly, and this has been proved again and again and again, and we still don't get it. In any crisis, the most important first responders are the survivors. Because if they don't respond well, there's nothing to respond to. And you look at the huge floods, you look at Sandy, you look at Fukushima. Sorry, if the survivors do not do well, the crisis is much, much worse. And if circumstances and the context interfere with those first responders, those survivors, or do not equip them properly, then it's much worse. I know of no country, that's wrong, I know of one country, it started last year, in their grade school, so between grade 8 and grade 12 equivalent, educating children on what to do in a crisis. Children. Not the police, not the fire department, not the transportation agencies, the children. And they do it for two reasons. One is because in not too distant future they're going to be the adults and the leaders. And if they don't become the adults and the leaders knowing how to be better first responders, the sort of crisis we've had again and again and again is going to continue. Think of the situation in the Philippines today. The Philippines is a country of islands with very indeterminate ferry service and very unreliable ferry service. Most of the ferries, because of the typhoon, don't exist anymore. So normal life is impossible. And it will be months, months, before the second responders get to those who survive because of the context in the Philippines. All the goodwill in the world, all the policy, all the money, all the supplies, I'm sorry, they aren't going to be effective for months. The future's arriving faster and faster. I mean, I'm not telling anybody that change is happening and because of globalization and all the things that globalization can be described with and as, it's happening faster and faster. But the problem with the future coming faster and faster is it's including more and more new history. I, I couldn't figure a way to do that with a picture, but this gentleman here with a bicycle raft with the water coming 
The water's behind him and it's coming up over top of him. And the faster he goes, the more water's going to come up over top of him. There is more history being rewritten now than there is history that is totally accepted. If you Google the story about education in Texas and Thomas Jefferson, you will find some quite astounding things. Mexican grade school history is being rewritten. Now one of the reasons so much history is changing, whether it's being added to, expunged, or just ignored, is because until very, very recently only victors wrote history. And victors were part of the well-being of the system. They won. Somebody else lost. Now, of course, anybody can write history. And one of the problems with all this history for our future is that the old history, whether or not it was good or accurate or whatever, remains. It does not die. It is not biodegradable. So the arguments about history and why you should do something tomorrow with or against somebody else or something is becoming more and more complicated. And the effect of that is the competence of our institutions, our schools, our organizations, our companies is frankly falling farther and farther behind what is needed for the context we're in and facing. Life. Uh, a group of us, including Walter Dorn, for years gave a course at the Canadian Peacekeeping Centre called Technology and Engineering in Life, Living, Moving and Working. So in relative terms, for us as individuals and our communities and so on, life until a few decades ago was pretty straightforward. There were lines and frameworks and you could predict things reasonable amount of time in advance. But in the last, pick a number, Internet 1995, it will just last 15 years, things are becoming pretty complicated and pretty complex. And in the absence of an existential crisis, like a huge asteroid taking us all out, or a massive pandemic killing half the world's population, Living, moving, and working will get increasingly complex and complicated. Not a threat, this is just a fact. How much do we think about the fact that it's going to be more complicated tomorrow than it was today, and more complicated next year than now? Some specifics. Four groups. Science and technology. This is a field that has very bluntly frightened me for a number of years. When I was in Asia, the expression was the military industrial complex. Still, President Eisenhower coined that phrase in 1961 in a very famous speech, the military industrial complex. And he was very worried about what it would do to democracy, commerce, and equality. Well, it's no longer just the military-industrial complex, it's the security-industrial complex. We have, in most countries today, more people in security than are in national armed forces. And our professor in Austria has done a modeling, and he figures that between one-eighth and one-twelfth of all employed people in the world are in security. And I've just made a picture. The commissionaire who you see at all government buildings. Rocket scientists. And special forces. The increase in the number of forces we do not know about is astounding. Now that sounds like a contradiction in terms. But because things are being done, we know somebody has to be doing them and therefore probably special forces. So we're no longer in this duality of the military and industry in their complex. It's 
everybody. When I lived in Jakarta, one of the people I worked for had this huge house. Huge house. He had two jaga. They're young men that sit at the gate. Now, they aren't very good guards, but they run really quickly. So if somebody came around the property, they could run to the security force. And this house was one of four in this community. And those four families had their own military force, which the government was quite happy with because it meant that was a place there wasn't going to be problems that the government would have to deal with. In the Indonesian, the country of Indonesia, 50% of the military budget is paid for by business. 50%. The military continues. That's because of the businesses they own and they run. Nanotechnology, little things, hugely beneficial on many fronts. But this reminds me, when I was in the military, whenever there was a runway, we were always worried about foreign object damage, stuff on the runway that got spit up into the engines. It's one of the reasons airplanes in Canada that fly into the Arctic on gravel runways have special flaps for their engines foreign object damage. We do not know. We have very little idea of these little wee tiny things that are proliferating, usually for good reasons, but not always, due to us inside. I understand that most cosmetics now are made with these little bubbles, little nanotechnology bubbles, because it makes them smoother, it makes their effect stronger. What does that mean for our well-being? 3D printing. I'm not worried about 3D printing, but that's a new factor. That's a new specific factor. It used to be very, very expensive. Used to be two and a half years ago, thousands of dollars. Now you can buy one on the internet for just over $600. And I read an article in the New York Times a little while ago pointing out that one of their columnists said, I want to have dinner by 3D printing. And he got people at Harvard to make him a three-course dinner with 3D printing. Now, he said it didn't taste very good, but it didn't taste bad. <laughs> Aged states. Back to your infrastructure issue. We used to talk, unfortunately we still do, about developing, develop, developing and underdeveloped states. Well, those developed states are now 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and the infrastructure is failing. So are we calling them redeveloping states? I don't know. But in Kingston, for the third year in a row, the Canadian Automobile Association have awarded one of our roads worst road in Ontario status. And yet we've had the center of the town dug up for most of the last two years to fix the 112-year-old sewage system. So infrastructure affects all our lives, whether it's water, electricity, and I'm not talking about bad people. I haven't mentioned terrorists, and that's the last time I'll use the word. Things just fall down when they get old or aren't maintained. United States of America, one of the figures I've seen, $182 billion to fix roads, bridges, and airfields, airports. And geoengineering, which I'm sure we've all heard about. I'm not sure how successful this is going to be. But we talk more and more about the problems that the world faces today are problems that no single nation can do on its own, can solve on its own, solve, make progress on on its own. And therefore, presumably, we're going to need big engineering projects because it's going to be multinational, international. So I presume geoengineering is in our future. I haven't seen anything yet that tells me who decides what geoengineering will be done. I don't know of any organization in the United Nations that says this geoengineering will be discussed in the General Assembly or the Security Council. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Now that doesn't worry me yet, but that will come. Geoengineering will be part of our context. Why? 
because of the power of the corporation, the corporate people will see huge profits, not sure, but huge business in geoengineering because it's big stuff. Specifics on government and governance. Um, and, and some of you will see a couple of things. Numbers and types of states. When the United Nations was formed, several decades ago, there were 51 states. There are now 193 in the UN, and not all states are in the United Nations. But that's not the important number. The important number is the number of states that are not the sort that are in the United Nations. Kosovo. Only about 60 other nations recognize Kosovo. But it's a state. It's got a passport. It's got a parliament. But how about states like Kurdistan? They have their own passport, but it isn't recognized. Or Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which is in Georgia, which the Russians and Georgians fought about. Russia recognizes them. There are about 90 of them in the world. And we say we believe in democracy and self-determination. So why can't a person in a state seek self-determination and democracy with their own state? Flailing states. The flailing, that's not a printing, I use that often. Flailing states are worse than failed states. Why? Because failed states, somebody's happy. The state that was has failed, but there's been another body form, a new state, almost invariably. They're happy. They're pleased. They've been fighting for this for years. Whereas flailing states, the stew just keeps going. So I don't worry about failed states nearly as much as I worry about failing states. Democracy. A few weeks ago when the United States government was shut down, I was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania and reminded very, very forcefully that the government was shut down but the lobbyists weren't. And there was a lot of lobbying going on when the government was shut down because guess what? The government people weren't at business. Now what were they discussing? Democracy. I, I, simply because it in part amused me, uh, I have the three pictures on the right. Jefferson, Mussolini and Churchill and the point about Churchill's, I think, is the one that relates to, can you see that? No. The best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> he said that. Who's that says that? Churchill. Churchill. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yeah. Well, read us the others. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, a democracy is, democracy is nothing more than mob rule, where 51% of the people may take away the rights of the other 49. Mussolini, democracy is beautiful in theory. In practice, it is a fallacy. You in America will see that someday. I am for democracy, but I wish it was more effective. That's part of our context. How do we make democracy more effective? I submit here in the city of Toronto there's been some questions about that recently as well. Privacy wars. We've all heard this discussion about privacy, liberty, and so on. The big issue is a privacy war. For a government, privacy means secrecy. For you and I, it means personal. Very different things. I don't know how the two will meet whether they're going to collide or they will pass by in the night. But the war between the privacy the government wants and the privacy we want and our communities want is going to continue to be an issue. And the status and state of science. You mentioned the issue about science, evidence, and so on. And how our government and it's certainly not the only one. I was in Turkey recently, and Mr. Erdogan is very, very keen on making sure that the science that is published is science that suits his program, his priorities, his interests. 
and maybe not others. But two weeks ago, The Economist, pretty good magazine. Full disclosure, The Economist is my Bible. I read it every week. I don't read some of the financial things because I can't understand them. But I read The Economist cover to cover. It's my update on the world. If you can get a hold of the scientists, those of you that believe that the people that are against evidence and science and muzzling scientists should read the articles. There's a leader, so one of the opening half-pagers, in fact it's a full-pager at the beginning of the magazine, and then a three-page special report on what is wrong with science. It's quite disturbing. Long and short of it is, the argument that science never discusses or publicizes or does peer reviews on when something is found to be wrong. So how much that has been peer reviewed is now wrong? Anyway, without confusing myself about the article, it disturbed me. I even brought it up in the pugwash meeting. Science piece. So government, governance, should we go back to just communities to govern? Who is governing right now? Specifics, people. You go to court. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I think you can tell the truth, <coughs> as you know it. And I think you can tell nothing but the truth but I defy anybody to tell the whole truth. You just don't know all of that. And with the internet and the rewriting of history and the globalization, the variety of opinions and how languages, when they're translated and moved about, fuzzify or myth the point. What is truth? I followed on television because I was waiting at the train station in Kingston this afternoon and there was Mr. Harper discussing truth having to do with the Senate scandal and people pointing out that they don't think he's told the whole truth. And frankly, here's another full disclosure, I don't think he knows the whole truth. I think he's probably, well, I'm pretty sure he's tried to find out. But I will bet you there are a lot of people keeping private some of the truths that should be on the table that maybe the Prime Minister doesn't know yet. Neurosis, we talked about that. The figures I've seen, 35% of Canadians and Americans have diagnosable mental health issues. 35%. Insurance. Picture on the right, the house in the life preserver. That's the good news. The second picture for me implies something else. I have been told by colleagues in the United States that the Sandy disaster bankrupted four major insurance companies already. So part of our context is if we have more and more of these extremes like storms, natural events, major accidents, and we think we're insured, we might not be. Lost space. Since the Second World War, there have been about 140 major disasters. And it's been like floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, cyclones, tsunamis. That's interesting, but that's not the main issue. The main issue is, most of the places that they damaged have not been recovered. If you go on the internet today and look at Haiti, the capital, and its suburbs, with the exception of a few buildings, it looks exactly as it did after that horrendous earthquake hit. If you go to Pakistan and look along the Irrawaddy River, the floods in 2010, and you do one of those Google things down, about a third of that flooded area is still unpeopled because it's unpeopleable. There are still parts of New York 
the city of the world after Sandy that has not been recovered. So we are losing space on which people live on. And the population's going up. And people, by and large, don't live on the water. But maybe that's one of our geoengineering projects. And further on water, heard again and again about the shortages, the lack of access, the unevenness. One of the things that worries me increasingly is the security of supplies we have. Security against infrastructure failure, security against poor governance, and the population's going up. And whether we like it or not, water is the only strategic material in our lives. I'm making the assumption that nobody's going to turn off the air. Even if it's foggy, smoggy, messy, smelly, there's air. And we need that all the time. But every human being needs water about daily. And water that doesn't kill them. Picture from Paris in 1910. Floods aren't new. Specific threats. A Danish physicist called Per Back, who was apparently brilliant, but a rebel, because he contested other people's theories, theorems, hypotheses, he developed the sand pile theory for the world. It's not dominoes. Remember, if one dominoes fall, the other go, and it was like a game. And it's called organized criticality. If you were, remember when you were a child and if you ever built sand piles, sometimes you could get them really high and other times you could hardly get them off the ground. It's not just dropping the grain, the next grain of sand on top of the sand pile, it's what's happening inside. And that's the globe we live in. It's not what you see. It's all the interrelationships among all the parts and all the elements that are changing. So organized instability. That's the reality. That's why things are so complex and complicated. Methane. This, in my view, is one of the elephants in the house. Again and again and again, more and more and more, we talk about CO2. CO, CO2. But it's methane. Because if climate change moves a little further ahead, the effect of methane will be orders of magnitude greater and more damaging. Sovereign citizen. Uh, if you were reading the paper a few weeks ago, the sovereign citizen on the bottom there between the two law enforcement officers is the gentleman that took over the lady's house in Edmonton. Declared himself a sovereign state. Unfortunately, some sovereign citizens are very, very violent. They will not accept authority. That's democracy in its final form. Maybe that's, maybe, that's the sort of thing that Thomas Jefferson was talking about. And the license plate, Ontario Freeman, I've seen one of them in Kingston. The reason he has put that on there is because he's against the new uh, angling and fishing rules. Not very serious, but he's not going to follow the rules. And the threat, I go back, it's about us, Pogo. I've seen the enemy and it is us. Because we're not taking our context seriously enough. So, my conclusion again, how secure can we be? I do not know. And that's exactly the slide I had on after my introductory one. So, my option. And it's sort of a tiered option. We can choose to be more resilient. We can't solve everything. We have to continue to make progress. Things are going to happen we can't predict good and bad. 
And sometimes the baddest thing that can happen to us, we have a tremendous opportunity and because we weren't ready for it, we lose it. We can become more resilient in the face of unpredictable, <coughs> uncertain, what's next? Resilience, the printing on the right, is the capacity of a system or a community or the globe to tolerate disturbance without collapsing, to withstand shocks, to rebuild itself when necessary, and to improve itself when possible. It's one of my favorite definitions. And the way we do that is by continuously, this is our progress, improving our competence for the context we are in and we face. And again, part of my painful experience, and this demands higher, higher levels of personal honesty. We all have biases, we all have assumptions, and we all have interests. And they're all different. The set is unique to every one of the 7.2 billion people on Earth. But very often, we don't acknowledge them. And when we're in contact, communication, collaboration with others, we don't listen very well to what the other's biases, assumptions, and interests are. And until we all listen better, more honestly, then we aren't going to make as much progress as we could. We can't solve all the problems, but we can continue to make progress, but only if we are improving our competence. Now, competence is a seminar that I do. Competence is more than somebody saying, I can do it. And I just give you some of the factors there. There's always a debate when I talk to people about this, whether they're public or private or grade school or university people doing uh, procurement logistics. Always a fight. And the fight usually begins what's the most important. And of course it depends what your context is and what you're trying to do. Thank you. And before I do open it up, because I really believe this, if you're going to buy two books, they aren't my books, I don't get anything from this, but if anything has shaken me up and helped me understand what I'm talking about, one is called Willful Blindness by Barbara Heffernan. Doesn't matter what you're in, what you're interested in, what your biases, assumptions, or interests are. And the other is Thinking the Unthinkable by Joshua Cooper Ramo. 2010 and 2011. So they're new. So they're very contextual. They're fun to read. I mean fun in every sense of that word. But they're also disturbing because it comes back to the business about being honest about your biases and assumptions and interests in the face of the biases, interests, and assumptions of everybody else. <laughs>